Hello, my name is Mark Gibson, and you're listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, a weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Today, we're delighted to be joined by uh, Jane Stout from Trinity College uh, Dublin. Uh, Jane, you're, you're welcome. And uh, we're joined once again by Pori Foley to, to help with the, the questioning. Jane will be talking to us today on the on the topic of, of natural capital in, in Irish farmland. So Jane, without any further ado, I'll, I'll hand over to you. So um, good morning. Thanks very much for, for inviting me to speak in, in this uh, series. Um, my name's Jane Stout. I'm a professor in botany in Trinity College Dublin in the School of Natural Sciences. Um, and I'm an ecologist and uh, my research spans a range of areas, some of them shown here. Uh, on the slide, but I'm very much interact interested in the interactions between people and nature. And in particular today, I want to talk about how, uh, I want to talk about the benefits that we derive from nature, particularly on farmland, and how we can account for those. But first I'm going to start with acknowledging my current team at Trinity. Um, we cover a wide range of research in my group. I'm going to talk about some of these projects today. So to humanise things a bit, I thought I'd show you the faces of the people involved and especially um, I'm going to talk about some of the work that um, Catherine and Andrew and uh, Kian have been working on and, and Kian's in here twice um, because he's transitioning between projects, not that, that I've made a mistake there. So uh, thanks to the whole team uh, and these are the people who have been working on some of the topics I'm going to be talking about today. So today I'm focusing on natural capital on farmland. Um, the concept of natural capital is gaining prevalence. Uh, it's key to the European Green Deal. So this is Europe's growth strategy, which aims to protect, conserve, and enhance the EU's natural capital. Um, and this is a, uh, a schematic from the Green Deal uh, showing priority areas. And we can see here that preserving Europe's natural capital is a target. And the, the document, the Green Deal document, even goes as far as saying that um, all EU policies should contribute to preserving and restoring Europe's natural capital. So this idea of natural capital is a concept that we, that we need to embrace and understand. But what is it? Um, what is natural capital? Actually, nobody knows more about natural capital than farmers. It's not a new concept, but a new language. And the idea is to link nature with the economy. So the concept bar borrows language uh, from economics uh, and from business. And the idea is that nature, all our, our natural resources, the living organisms, the rocks, the soil, the rain, the sun, all of this allows production, uh, of, of biomass, growth of crops or grass to feed livestock, which results in marketable goods. Um, and so you get this flow of goods and services from nature and these fuel economic activity. And the natural capital concept rests on this idea of stocks and flows. And this is just borrowing the, the, the language of, of economics and business um, in order to um, make sure that the concept um, uh, is, is communicable. So the, the reason for using the language, uh, this language, is to bring nature into a political and economic arena where it's been very much neglected um, and therefore not, um, not looked after. So what else do we get from our stocks of natural capital on farmland apart from these marketable goods? Well, the point is that we get lots of other ecosystem services. So ecosystem services, these are the outputs from ecosystems that have a, a benefit and a value to humanity. So the outputs from our stocks of natural capital that benefit um, uh, human well-being. So in our farmed landscape, we don't just produce marketable products. We don't just produce livestock, crops, etc. But there's lots of other benefits that, are, that come from these farmed landscapes. So we get carbon sequestration and storage, and this helps to regulate climates. We get water filtration and attenuation uh, for, for drinking water, for flood alleviation. In the soils, we get nutrient cycling. We get the, the formation and maintenance of healthy soils, which are obviously so important for, for crop and, and for grass growth mediated by, by microorganisms and other organisms in the soil. Um, uh, hedges and, and uh, shelter belts give us windbreaks, shelter for, for livestock and for people. Um, habitats 
uh, provide resources for, for beneficial invertebrates like pollinators, natural en enemies of, of crop pests, and I'll come back to those in, in a moment. Um, we have berries and wild uh, and a fungi for wild foraging. Catherine mentioned this in her talk about the role of hedgerows um, earlier this month. Uh, and there's habitats for wildlife, for, for, for birds, for, for um, insects, uh, for plants, our biodiversity, which is in demise worldwide. And also we get these landscapes for recreation, for inspiration, for, for physical well-being. Um, and this photograph actually is one that I took while cycling the Greenway in County Mayo. So this is this landscape is providing this service um, for uh, residents, for, for tourists, for, for recreation, for, for inspiration. And this is an important point about the natural capital concept. It's not just about production and economics, and it's not just about ecology and nature. It's also about livelihoods and well-being. So it's about people uh, and it's about bringing in these, these social and cultural values into our understanding of, of the landscape as well. Um, and we can classify these outputs into groups. Um, and I don't know if you can see the, the different colours very well here, it's not showing up very well on my screen, but um, the ecosystem services concepts allows us to categorise output, outputs from ecosystems that have benefit uh, into different groups. So our, um, our production of crops and livestock and products, uh, these are provisioning services, and you see these on here in this kind of pale orange. Um, the, the carbon sequestration and storage, the, the, the water filtering and attenuation, uh, all of these help to regulate the environment. We get regulation of the climate, regulation of water, regulation of plant and insect populations. So these are our regulating services. And then we also have these cultural services, these landscapes for, for recreation and, and well-being. And these, these aren't black and white categories. So for example, wild foraging may be providing food. So, so there's a provisioning there, but it also wild foraging is a cultural activity. If we provide habitat for wildlife, that wildlife might provide other regulating services. So pollinators and natural enemies, or might be enabling cultural services. So providing habitat for, for birds, uh, for bird watching. And importantly, a lot of these benefits come from the non-farmed areas, from the areas where production isn't happening. These non-farmed areas are so-called unproductive areas, but they're only unproductive in terms of the provisioning services. They're very productive if we think about them uh, in terms of all these other services that are being provided on farmland. So we need to stop thinking about non-productive areas as being worthless because they actually do have great value. Um, and, and they should be maintained and farmers should be properly rewarded for maintaining them. So, for example, these non-farmed areas can be home to lots of ecosystem service providers uh, like insects. So my favourite organisms on farmlands, not everyone's favourite organisms, um, but flower visiting insects act as pollinators. Um, it's not all about the bees and the pollinators. Bees get all the attention. Lots of other insects do important things too ecologically and in terms of contributing to uh, our economy, our society, our health and well-being. So things like dung beetles are really important for, for burying dung, which reduces spoiling or fouling of grasslands, recycles nutrients, and also reduces pest and disease loads in cattle. Uh, ladybirds, lacewings, predatory beetles, parasitoid wasps, a whole range of insects act as, as predators of insects that might otherwise become crop pests. So they're really important natural enemies to regulate populations of potential pests. And things like ants do incredible jobs, distributing seeds, turning over the soil, influencing the physical and chemical structure of the soil. And a lot of these ecosystem service providers need this, this non-farmed habitat uh, in the landscape in order to complete their life cycle. And when we talk about the importance of these creatures and we talk about the importance of biodiversity, it's because diversity underpins the delivery of all these services. And so global studies have shown that when you've more insect of, sorry, more species of, of insect pollinators, so these two graphs here on the left, we see the relationship between the, the species richness of pollinators, on the right, the species richness of natural enemies, and then on the y-axis, it's the, the, the the level of pollination and the level of, of biocontrol. And you can see as you increase the species richness, as you have more diversity in both pollinators and in natural enemies, you've got an increase in the provision of these services of pollination uh, and natural um, control of crop pests. 
And other studies are showing, showing similar things. So um, uh, when you've got more species of tree in your forest, this increases the productivity um, in, in terrestrial forests. These, both of these studies are, are sort of global meta-analyses. Um, and also studies from, from, from here in Ireland have shown that when you've more species in a grassland sward, this can increase biomass uh, productivity through the year. So diversity really does matter. And increased diversity makes ecosystems more stable, more resilient and more resistant to changes in climate. So this study showed that biodiversity increased ecosystem resistance for a broad range of climate events, including wet or dry, moderate, extreme, brief or, or prolonged events. Biodiversity stabilizes ecosystem productivity and productivity dependent ecosystem services by increasing this, this resistance to, to, to changes in climate. So diversity is really important um, in these systems for the provision of services and for, the, um, uh, the, uh, for coping with, with changes in climate. And it's not just species diversity that's important uh, in the landscape, it's, it's habitat diversity too. So ecosystem services are supplied from, from all parts of the farm, from, from the soil, from the farmed and the non-farmed areas. And, and all of this is influenced by how uh, the farm is managed, what kind of management is, is implemented. So all of this influences the delivery of ecosystem services, and all of this is underpinned by our natural capital. And it's not just the case on farmland. So natural capital underpins society and economy more broadly. So without nature, there are no flows of services and benefits for, for society that, that power the economy. So nature, as well as being our life support system, you know, ultimately everything comes from nature. Often it's modified with human input, but, but ultimately everything comes from nature. And so destroying or not protecting nature destroys our well-being and our economies. And so protecting nature is, is fundamental to, to a sustainable future. And this has been recognised with the, the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, and it's been suggested that economies, shown in the, the goals at the top of this, this um, uh, so it's, it's, it's a wedding cake of, of Sustainable Development Goals, the goals at the top correspond with economy, then we have the ones for society in the middle, and they're underpinned by these um, uh, biosphere goals. So it's been suggested that economies and societies are seen as embedded uh, in parts of the biosphere. And this, this wedding cake of SDGs shows that basically if we don't get the bottom layers right, we can't achieve the top ones. If we don't get a sustainable biosphere, we can't have uh, a sustainable society or economy. And even though when you Google capital, the first four images you get are these four, all to do with money, the natural capital approach is not about putting a price on nature. And I think that's often a, a common misconception that it's all about trying to, to valorize the price on nature. It's about valuing nature. Now, this might seem like the same thing, but value isn't the same of, as, as price. So value implies the, the worth of a good or service for an individual. And price is the amount of money that's paid by the buyer to the seller in exchange for, for a product or service. So prices is arbitrary, but value is fundamental. So for example, imagine I'm selling gold bars uh, for five euro a piece. The price of these gold bars in this instance is five euro. This is, this is arbitrary. It's just the amount that I've chosen to, to sell the gold bars uh, at, um, for, for reasons only known to me. Yet in spite of the fact that the price is five euro, their value is so much more. So natural capital is not about putting a price on nature, it's about valuing nature. And when we talk about valuing nature, there are, there are lots of different ways that we can do it. So if outputs from, nature's do, outputs from nature do have a market, um, so uh, a lot of the, the outputs, the provisioning services, the, the, um, uh, the goods that are, are outputs from nature, when they have a market, we can use the market price as a proxy for value. This, this isn't perfect because price doesn't always reflect the costs of production um, because free services from nature are, are not taken into account. So for example, soil organisms, creating the soil, dung recyclers, 
contributing to, to nutrient cycling. Um, and also the price often doesn't reflect any long-term damage to nature from production. Um, but an awful lot of outputs from nature don't have a market. So there's, there's no market for the, the, the elderberries harvested from hedgerows um, to make wine in the autumn or, or for the views across uh, beautiful landscapes. And so proxies, uh, you know, maybe asking people what kind of landscape they like to look at, you know, carrying a survey or, or determining preferences by counting how many people go and harvest the berries or how far they drive to do so. Um, we get, help us to, to, to provide these proxies, or we can use replacement costs. So if we destroy a floodplain, how much will it cost to put in flood defences or to fix people's houses when they get flooded? So we can create these proxies when there isn't a market for, 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 for mainly for services from, from nature. Um, but for most things, there isn't a price, um, but that doesn't mean there isn't any value. And I think this, this, this is a really important concept. So my speciality is in uh, pollinators and pollination ecology. So I'm going to give you an example of the different values of pollinators and pollination services. So pollinators and pollination services do contribute to, to direct use values in terms of contributing to crop production. And in fact, actually, almost every argument for protecting pollinators is based on the fact that they're vital to our food supply. And we can calculate how much they're worth in terms of how they contribute to production. So for each crop, we can determine how dependent it is on, on pollinators. So this little graph here just shows uh, how we calculate this dependency ratio. So in the blue bar, this might be our production or our yield uh, with pollinators present. And the orange bar would be what the yield would be um, if pollinators were absent. And this difference between yields is our dependency ratio. So we take this dependency here, so, so here hypothetically it's a crop that's 50% dependent on pollinators, so it can still produce a yield without pollinators, but that yield is, is reduced by 50%. If we multiply this dependency ratio by a yield and by a price of the crops on the market, we can come up with a market value of pollination. And we can put a financial figure on that. And this has been done globally, it's been done regionally, um, and we did some work a, a couple of years ago to do this uh, nationally. So an EPA funded project, um, we did this calculation, incorporated some economic modelling and uh, came to the conclusion that home produced crops in Ireland, uh, the, the value of pollination services, sorry, to, to home produced crops in Ireland uh, is between about 20 and 59 million euro per year. So pollinators contribute to marketed goods and we can calculate the, the value of this contribution in monetary terms. But they also uh, have a direct use value for things that aren't bought and sold on the market. So the medicinal plants or the wild forage berries, um, or they make up the landscapes that we directly use for recreation. And there's not necessarily a market for these. They also contribute indirectly to ecosystems. So they contribute to uh, increasing resist resilience in ecosystems, to nutrient cycling, to, to soils, through the, the influence they have on the plant communities. And then there's lots of values associated with us not using pollinators and their services. So they, they may have no value to us right now, or so be of, of no value to us right now, but they give us the potential to do something different in the future. It means we have options. And just their existence is of value to some. So there's, there's 20,000 different species of bee worldwide. I'll never see them all in my lifetime uh, or, or necessarily use anything that they contribute to, but they have value to me. I have satisfaction from knowing that they exist. And finally, there's a moral or, or bequest value. We have an obligation to future generations to, to leave nature for them. So the total value of pollinators is much more than just their contribution to crop production. But most of these other values can't be expressed in monetary terms. So some aspects of nature are, are impossible or, or difficult to monetize. Uh, and values are inherently anthropocentric and subjective. Each person may be prepared to, to, to pay different amounts. So why do we even talk about the value of nature in monetary terms when we miss so much of the real value? And this, this figure here shows um, some of these values. So 23 billion 
dollars um, in, in flood control and water retention. Um, economic cost of soil erosion is 53. Um, euro per hectare per year, um, pest and disease control annual losses by accidental introductions is estimated to be a hundred billion dollars per year. These are these are big numbers. And the idea behind actually putting some financial values uh, on um, the, the, the services or the benefits we get from nature is that it draws attention to the importance of nature to people. And economic valuations, financial valuations like this, excuse me, can really help to reveal the scale of the problem in a metric that everyone understands, money. Everybody understands money. So it's a metric that we all get. Whereas if we start talking about tons of carbon um, or we start talking about liters of water, it, it, it doesn't make sense to everyone. So by using monetary values, you can draw attention to the scale of the problem uh, and, and, and really um, put it in terms that people understand. It's not everything, but economic valuation can complement and strengthen uh, ethical and scientific arguments. Doesn't substitute them, but can complement and strengthen them. <clears throat> Excuse me. It also allows for appropriate financial payments, for compensation, for cost benefits, for, for financial and other supports for, for conservation. And in terms of, you know, making this case, if you want to conserve a particular species or conserve a particular habitat, then you have to convince people why they should do it. So, for example, with the all island pollinator plan, we have to think about what the value of pollinators is, not just the financial value, but the contribution to landscapes, the contribution to well-being, uh, the contribution to future potential. And once people are more aware of the value of nature, then they may be more uh, motivated to protect it. So, one use of the natural capital approach uh, is natural capital accounting. Now, this sounds totally like something financial, right? But it's not. It's about quantifying natural capital and tracking change. So natural capital accounting, what it does is it, it, it systematizes environmental information into an accounting format that tells, that tells a, a story of change over time. And so natural capital accounting is a process of determining the extent, condition, uh, and condition of assets uh, of our natural capital. Uh, it's a process of determining the, the services and benefits that flow from that. So it's about this, it's, it's using this natural capital concept of stocks and flows. Uh, we we uh, want to understand the extent of our stocks, the condition of those stocks, and the services and benefits that flow from them. Um, and it's what we're exploring uh, currently in one of our research projects, so the INCASE project, which uh, stands for Irish Natural Capital Accounting for Sustainable Environments. This is an EPA funded project where we are testing this natural capital accounting approach uh, at catchment scale. But we can also do this at a farm scale. Uh, it's, it's hard to map individual species. Um, uh, you know, you need a lot of um, a lot of effort, a lot of expertise to map individual species, but we can map habitats. So we can create accounts from mapping habitats. And this is a habitat map of Shinnock Farm in, in West Cork, part of the Carberry Group. And this was surveyed by uh, Kian, um, who's, who's one of the researchers in my group, um, as part of an SFI funded project called Farm Zero C. Um, in this habitat map, then, the, the green areas are, are the, the fields, the farmed areas, the, the grassy areas, and the other colours represent hedgerows, woodland, built structures, etc. So we can quantify the amount of each habitat type, um, and we can quantify the amount of uh, farmed versus non-farmed areas, the, the, these habitats that Dara was talking about uh, last week in his presentation. And on this, in, on this farm, in, on Chinook, these um, non-farmed habitats make, make up about 9% of the total farm area. It's, it's, it's quite an intensive dairy farm. And this is basically an extent account. So the extent account measures the amount of different uh, habitat types um, at different levels. So in this case at farm level, but as I say in the case project, we're working at catchment level and the CSO, Central Statistics Office, are, are working on this at a national level. But, it, but this is basically um, an, 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 
uh, asset extent uh, account can be generated from these data. It's often called an asset register, basically a baseline of what's physically there in terms of habitats. And here's some of those non-farm elements on Chinook Farm. And mapping and quantifying the amount of these um, allows us to, to track change over time and also to meet minimum uh, habitat area um, requirements for, for future policy compliance, etc. And then the next step is to determine the condition of these habitats. And this is more tricky. Uh, this is where we need uh, indicators and we need quality scores of different habitats. And as Catherine said in her talk on the hedgerows, not all hedgerows are the same. Uh, those that have been cut into, into neat boxes don't provide resources for pollinators, they don't store as much carbon, and they're lower in, in natural capital or, or biodiversity quality. Um, and uh, Dara uh, mentioned last week the Farm Ecos project that we, that we work on together. Um, and as part of that project, we're developing habitat quality score um, uh, assessment methods um, so that you can actually um, score the quality of these different habitats um, and, uh, and, and come to some quantification of habitat quality. And so this gives us then an idea, not only of the extent of the different types of habitat on the farm, but the condition uh, of those different habitat types as well. So for example, uh, here in Chinook, we have a, a grassy bank in the top left here in poor condition, a low number of plant species, not providing resources uh, for, for pollinators, for example. And in the bank on the, the bottom right, it's good condition. We've got a high number of plant species uh, providing resources for, for pollinators or natural um, enemies of pests uh, or whatever. And this condition, uh, this condition score could be assessed by the number of species, that the habitat supports, we could count the flowers for pollinators or the pollinators themselves, and depending on their abundance or diversity, we can refine these, these scores for condition. But the idea is to produce some um, uh, way of assessing quality without having to do the very detailed uh, taxonomic assessment that a, that, that a professional ecologist would do. And if we think about hedgerows, again, we've got some hedgerows in poor condition, some hedgerows in good condition. And by looking at the physical structure and the botanical composition, so what species are growing in the hedge hedgerow, then you can assign an overall quality score. So these, these scorecards would take into account the width and the height of the hedgerow, um, as well as uh, particular plant species that, that, that are indicators of, of quality. And, and this isn't a, a, a brand new concept. There's various projects doing this, developing these scorecards, various of the EIP projects, for example. Um, so for example, we're doing this, uh, a similar thing as part of the uh, Protecting Farm and Pollinators EIP, which, which I'm involved with, which is led by the National Biodiversity Data Center. And what this project is doing is developing farm level scores. Again, based on a series of criteria that make the farm more pollinating pollinator friendly, but that allow an assessment of, of condition of habitats that could go into a natural capital account. So we, we know the, the asset extent, we know the asset condition, or at least we, we, we're starting to develop metrics by which we can assess asset condition. Um, and these habitats are supporting species and have physical features that allow them to provide a range of ecosystem services and so to the, the next step would be to create um, uh, uh, service accounts so um, to try and understand the service flows from each of these different habitat types and from from, from the farm uh, in totality um, so you know to do this we need data on flows so we'd need to know how much pollination is being provided, how much dung recycling, how much natural pest control or, or carbon storage. So we could, we could measure flows of services from these habitats, look at pollen transfer, look at predation, uh, the number of bird species that are protected by hedgerows, the reduction in wind speed, the tons of carbon stored, or the number of people wild foraging, um, or, or from water features, you know, the volume of water, the tons of carbon stored, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the point is that, that to, to quantify um, these service flows, we need an awful lot of information, an awful lot of data. And these services flow not just, as I said, from, from the so-called productive areas, but also from the non-farmed areas as well. 
And finally, then these services could be converted into benefits. Um, so they could be financial benefits or proxies for those things that don't have a market that I, that I mentioned earlier. Um, we could use things like carbon pricing could be used as a means to put a financial value on the carbon stored by different habitats. So mature, uh, tall hedgerows that are not only better for, better for wildlife, but store more carbon. You've then you've got a financial incentive to, to protect them if you go to this next step and, and look at benefits. But as I said before, values are subjective. Who fixes this carbon price? We know that there are issues with carbon pricing. To, to whom are these different habitats valuable? You know, I love to see the flowering bank, but others might perceive it as messy or, or an indicator of a poor farming practice. So this process of natural capital accounting starts with this, this asset register or this, uh, this understanding of, of our stocks, of, of the, um, the extent of our assets. And then we can look at the quality or condition, the service flows um, and the benefits. So this is the process of natural capital accounting. <coughs> Excuse me. And these, these services um, have different values to different people. And I've mentioned that a couple of times. And the other thing with this is that, the, that some of them have a private short-term value. So for example, some of the provisioning services, whereas others have public long-term value, like climate regulation services. So in using this approach to assign value or to uh, understand the benefits, it's important to think about both uh, short-term local value and, and long-term public value and a whole spectrum in between. So it's difficult, um, it's, it's complicated. Uh, and natural capital accounting pro approach um, could, has the potential to help policymakers understand the dependence of economic development on natural resources um, for both supplying materials, for supplying services, um, and as well as for, for absorbing waste and pollution. Natural capital is our, our life support system and, and absolutely critical for economic recovery. And using accounting of principles to track stocks and flows with standardized data that's comparable over space and time, this could be a very powerful tool uh, in helping to, to, to make the case for nature. It's very much an emerging discipline. It's massively data hungry. Um, the, the extent accounts, the first step, they're, they're, they're sometimes the first and only step. Um, we need habitat maps, we need quantification of different types of habitat. Even doing this uh, requires layering of different data sets if we're doing it at a large scale, because we need to understand where the rivers and streams are, the topographical features, the woodlands, the wetlands, what kind of farmland use there is, etc. And there's lots of, lots of data gaps. Um, and, and then, you know, that's even that's just looking at the, the asset extent when we get to service flows. It's, it's incredibly difficult. And, and, and as I say, very um, data hungry. Um, if you want to find more uh, out about natural capital accounting, um, the Irish Forum on Natural Capital uh, hosts this, this lovely explainer video. It's, it's, it's uh, a very short animated video that explains this concept of natural capital accounting. I won't play it now, but the, the link is there. So to sum up the natural capital approach, what it does do is it allows us to recognize the value of nature and our dependencies on it. Um, and in using data, we can inform decision making and we can weigh up trade offs with more complete information because at the moment those trade offs are made with incomplete information. And by taking a systems approach, not just working in silos of production or payments or pollution, the idea of the natural capital approach is to bring this all together. And, and ultimately, it could help us to recognize the unrecognized values of nature, to reward farmers and other landowners appropriately for that, and make sure the costs of production, the full costs, are recognized in the price that the consumer pay, pays uh, for products. So to summarize, uh, natural capital frames nature as an asset to be protected and invested in in the future. Uh, we can measure, account for, and allocate nature with the same level of exactitude as we do for, for other kinds of capitals, financial, built, human capital. Uh, economic valuation can help, so putting financial uh, values on can help, but there are other ways. It's not all about uh, uh, financial um, values. 
Uh, and natural capital's true value is obviously priceless. None of us would be here without the natural world um, underpinning everything we do. But right now, in our systems, uh, priceless is the same as worthless. And so the natural capital approach is one way to address this issue. Uh, and I'll take any questions. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Jane. That was thought provoking to say that, to say the least. Um, we, again, just to remind you, uh, if you have questions for Jane, uh, would you uh, just uh, type them into the uh, questions and answers? We have some uh, questions coming through, but I suppose, Jane, one kind of question that I have is, is we have our policymakers now facing into a period of, if you want, uh, uh, reforming the, the common agricultural policy and a whole pile of, of, of other policy discussions going on from uh, the, our climate policy right through to our, our program for government. What messages and, and what support, I think, uh, can the, the notion of valuing natural capital uh, give to them in terms of, of uh, coming up with policies that are going to make a real difference? It's not, not a difficult question now. <laughs> well, I think it's, it's all about um, taking this integrated approach. And so, you know, look, rather than looking at policies in silos, is looking at the whole uh, system. And that rather than just looking at a single policy to, to do, you know, to do something over here, is that looking at the whole system. So, for example, our climate policies, um, you know, there, there's a lot that we can do with nature that can help to tackle the climate crisis. Um, and, and that, that you know, the, the, then there's, there's, there's win-wins because you, can, you, you want to be able to tackle the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, you want to be able to make sure that food is still produced in a sustainable way and that the farmers are still supported. And so it's pulling that all together rather than working in, in silos. I think that's, that's the key thing for me about the natural capital approach and really this idea of, of understanding the, the, the value of, um, of, of things that haven't been valued in the past. And so that's why they've been degraded uh, and destroyed. Yeah, and I noticed in, in your, your kind of two examples, your, your picture from the, the, the Greenway and then the Chinook Farm, they're kind of two ends of almost of, of the spectrum, kind of indicating to me that you're saying that there is value in every, uh, in, in, in every place and, and we can build on it. Is that a fair comment? Absolutely, and the, and you're not going to get the same values from everywhere. So it might it might be that there 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 there's a balance, there's a trade-off of values. So maybe you're not producing as much from the the, the more extensive farming, um, but there are still lots and lots of uh, values that are coming, lots of benefits that are coming from from those you know less productive and and. Uh, uh, habitats in the way that we currently measure them. You know, we currently measure them in terms of productivity using just one or two metrics, but there's lots and lots of other metrics that can be used um, to, to measure that, that, that productivity. And it's just, it's just looking at it from a different angle. Tarek, loads of questions coming in there. Lots of questions in and lots of comments. And I guess the first one, Pat, in there is by Turbator is new word of the week. Fantastic. So that's a good start. You're ready to get people straight <laughs> away um, on a Friday. Um, Jane, I, I suppose the first question in is, are we doing a poor job of marketing the natural capital, both to farmers and the general public? You know, sometimes farmers are getting a bad rap. Is, is how can we improve that? I think so. I think it's, you know, by, by making um, the, the, the value more visible. Um, so, so this understanding that you do get so much more from nature, I think, you, you know, we're very conditioned into thinking that farmland provides us with food. Um, and yes, farming provides us with food, but it also provides all this other stuff. Uh, and I think if that was uh, more widely understood and considered, um, you know, that, that, that would help. Uh, and, and that would also help with this argument about trade-offs. So yes, there are some en environmentally damaging practices, but there's also these benefits. So it's about weighing up those, those costs and benefits and, and doing it in a, in a, in a broad and holistic way. Okay, so the next question we have is the current advice regarding the impact of livestock produ production systems on the environment, so production of greenhouse gas emissions, for example, methane, is to increase productivity by means of intensification of production systems. These systems correlate negatively with biodiversity. 
how the approach of natural capital and ecosystem services could impro improve the vision of intensification of the production of, for example, milk? Um, so, I'll just be reading the question there, thank you. Um, so increasing intensification of production, I think the, the, what we need to do is intensify uh, production uh, in a more sustainable way. So the natural capital approach can help us to look at those trade-offs um, and look at the, um, you know, so, so take a broader view. So um, we can look more to ecological intensification, so working with nature as opposed to against nature. So that, that's a concept that, that's important. Um, and understanding what the impacts and dependencies are. Um, so if the, um, the increase in intensification is having a negative impact on biodiversity and the delivery of these other services, then increased intensification isn't something that makes sense um, it, it economically. Uh, and in terms of, of, of um, societally as well. So it's, it's, it's about understanding those trade-offs. I don't know if I explained that very well, but um, it's, it's, it's have it, having a, a fuller picture, a more complete picture, I think. And in the complete picture, and I guess we asked Ari this last week as well, you mentioned Shinnok is 9% um, of the, the overall farm and zone farmed area. Where would you like to see that, that percentage? Uh, oh gosh, I'd like to see that percentage much, much higher, but um, <laughs> I'm not sure that that's realistic. I mean, the EU biodiversity strategy that was just published this year put a figure of 30% of, 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 of um, land area managed for nature. Um, so, you know, we, we, we do need to get much higher. We need to get up, you know, the, there's no avoiding the fact we are in a biodiversity crisis, um, that we do need to protect and restore nature and, and that 9% probably isn't enough. 30% um, is the aspiration. I suspect we'll probably end up somewhere in between. Okay. We've got another question here from um, Conor O'Brien. How does biodiversity moder moderate climate change? You mentioned some studies uh, that show this. Can you expand, please? Okay. Um, so in terms of uh, biodiversity, the, the, as, as um, plants, uh, are pulling in carbon from the atmosphere, storing carbon, sequestering carbon in their roots. Um, if there's, there's more diversity, if there's more um, uh, biomass accumulation in, in those plants, there's more carbon being drawn in. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, we have somebody here that slightly disagrees with you. Um, I would argue that putting a monetary value on nature is to frighten people rather than drawing attention to it or adequately re rewarding those good farmers who are very aware of the interaction of semi-intensive farming in nature. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely appreciate that. And um, it's, you know, the, the people that are, the, that I guess those, those numbers are trying to frighten are the, the policymakers that have been ignoring nature. Um, so you put a big, a big monetary value on it, uh, then it might be seen as more important, more politically uh, important. You know, you listen, listen to, to, to politics locally, globally, um, money talks, um, economies talk. Um, and so I think it's, I think it's the, the policymakers we need to frighten. Okay. A semi philosophical question from, from Tom Healy. Uh, it's a great presentation, Jay, uh, Jane. An economist suggested uh, to me recently that accounting for the contribution of nature is, is like disaggregating the inputs of a moving wheel, a driver, a horse, and a cart. Uh, maybe putting uh, a pounds or a, a euro estimate on natural capital is less helpful. Uh, than spatial stories and deep understanding of the inner relationships. Not sure where that leaves us when it comes to monetary estimates. Uh, I think there's there's a there, there there there's something in there. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. And I, and and you know, this is we always end up at the the bottom line of money. Um, but actually, the process of understanding and disaggregating, you know, what we've got spatially in terms of habitats and what those habitats are providing. You know, you don't have to go all the way to saying and how much that's worth. You know, just that process of understanding what's being delivered, these, these you know, biophysical measurements, quantifications that, that, that aren't to do with money, they're difficult to compare, it's more tricky um, to, to trade off, but, but it, it, it raises the vis visibility, at least brings it into the conversation, where, whereas it, you know, it, 
that's been lacking in the past. Okay, we've another one here. Could the Lipis data set be expanded to record habitats on farms in more detail? And could a land use review proposed underpin the natural capital accounting across farms? Yes, please. Uh, absolutely. Um, if, 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 you know, the, the, at the moment, the, 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 the Lipis um, records non-productive areas as, as these areas that are producing so much waterways, um, uh, you know, lots of these other far, uh, non-farmed areas on, uh, are doing an awful lot. And, and yeah, we don't know where they are. You know, this, this mapping that we did of Shinnok was, was you know, Coral Key and walking around, you know, these sites and actually physically mapping the site. Um, we do need a, a, a proper land use map for, for, the, for the whole country in that kind of detail. And that's, that's coming. That, that, that's coming next year, hopefully. Um, and that will help this process of natural capital accounting, because at the moment we're pulling together data sets, we're walking across fields with a clipboard, um, using remote sense data, layering things up. It's incredibly data intensive and, and uh, person intensive. So absolutely, land use review would be um, fundamental to, to starting this process of natural capital accounting to do it properly. And have there been any conversations, Jane, to try and bring that um, forward? You know, obviously it's very intensive. You have a lot of people involved in Shinnok um, doing the walks with the clipboards and so on. Are there conversations out there about bringing this on a regional, county or national scale? Yeah, well, that's, um, and, and, you know, so we've done it at Shinnok at the, at the farm scale. That's hard enough. We're in the in-case project. We're trying to do it at a catchment scale. That's really difficult. <laughs> and, and then at a national scale, you lose the detail. So it's it's really it's it, it we do need as as nationally we need to make more effort to um you know a lot of these these data already exist but not in a format that can be used together that they're, they're not there's no there's no um they're not layered uh, anywhere centrally you know they're little data sets all over the place and they have to kind of manually be brought together and layered up um so there, there is a data issue here definitely Okay, we've talked about the farmers and we've talked about, um, I suppose, policymakers, but there's a good question in here on how could the agri-food companies better balance the short-term private benefits versus the long-term public benefits? Um, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think it's, you know, around this idea of that we're not paying the full um, cost, you know, the price we pay doesn't reflect the cost. Um, so, you know, if we can have, if, if for example, we can um, uh, incorporate the, the, the quality of habitats into the, the market price, um, that could be very powerful. So farmers that, that are uh, farming in, in a way that's improving habitat quality, if they get a premium um, for their product, then that can be a way of, of encouraging more, more positive behaviour. Okay, and kind of on, on the same train of thought and nearly back to our first question around marketing, but how would Jane communicate the importance of valuing diversity delivery from primary producers to consumers so that they understand that cheap food and sustainable food are two very different things? Yeah, that, that, that's kind of the million dollar question, isn't it? Um, I think that's, that's something that we do need to do. I mean, cheap, food has never been so cheap. Um, farmers have probably never been so squeezed. Um, it, and, and the environment's never been so damaged. So it's all, you know, the whole thing needs tipping on its head. Um, but because we're a global economy, a global market, that, that needs to be done globally. And, and, and so it's, it's difficult. It's, it's very difficult. We've got a very direct question here. Where can we read more about the farm scale in case map? Uh, so the InCase project, you can read more on the website uh, www.incaseproject.com. Uh, that's a that's catchment scale. Uh, the farm scale, the Chinook work, that's literally, we've just, Kian's just come back in from the field and that's not, not available yet, but, but there will be something soon. Um, in general, I'd say keep an eye on the website of the Irish Forum on Natural Capital, which is www.naturalcapitalisland.com. Um, and that tends to pull together natural capital resources, uh, projects, stories, blogs. You can sign up there and get a, a newsletter that will, will keep you informed. That was a pure marketing blitz. You've been asked that question before, totally. I can tell. <laughs> Good stuff. Um, thanks, Jane. Another question here. To what extent do you see the Water Framework Directive, Catchment Management Planning, Floods Directive, Flood Risk Management Plan as possible mechanisms for promoting the NCA approach? 
uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, their policies and plans that I'm not intimately familiar with, but the idea of, of a sort of a catchment scale approach where you've some you've different areas delivering different kinds of services um, is really, really important because you then, again, it comes to this idea of trade-offs is, is that obviously, you know, we can't have pristine wildlife everywhere. Um, but if you work at a, a catchment scale, then you can, you can start to understand how these different habitats are interacting with each other, how they're connected, and what as, as, a, as a total uh, they're providing. So I, I think there, there is a role. I don't know exactly what it is yet. Are the amounts of insecticides, herbicides, and so on estimated when evaluating natural capital? Um, at the moment, pesticide use... Um, would probably come into these condition scores. So the, the okay. um, as I say, we need you know, scores and indicators for condition, probably pesticide use would, would, would come under, under that uh, and be incorporated into one of those quality scores. Okay. There's a question there, Parik, it, it just strikes me as, as kind of getting to the heart of things. What difference, if any, would, this, would your research make to, to farmers? Gosh, yes, that is direct. Um, well, I mean, hopefully, hopefully it reassures farmers that that um, the researchers are aware of, of the fantastic job they're doing and, and of all the benefits that we we, we know come from farmland. Um, and in terms of highlighting all those benefits, I mean, farmers are, are stewards of the landscape. There's, the, you know, most of Ireland is covered in farmland. Um, so it's, it's really important for, for protecting biodiversity. Um, and we need to develop systems to support those farmers such that that biodiversity can be maintained, enhanced and restored. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's, it's definitely a, a, a case of, of working together. I mean, I think we're all on the same page. Yeah, and I suppose that there's a, a couple of questions coming in, uh, or comments coming in uh, on a common theme that we've had over the last uh, three weeks from Michael Hennessy. The, the current situation in policy uh, uh, or with policymakers excludes loads of areas on nearly all farms, such as old forests, larger coppice areas, the margins beside the shed, and how far off are policymakers uh, from uh, accepting and recognizing the value of these, of potential value of these areas? I mean, I can't answer for the policymakers, but that's what we're trying to work towards is to really to make the case that these areas are valuable and need to be valued. Um, and I think there's a comment on, uh, there from Don Sheen, Sheen as well, making the same point that we really need to be focusing a, a part of the, the cap payment on performance of, 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 in, of these areas as opposed to the, the baseland areas. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Pardon? We need a new marginal abatement cost curve that doesn't look at greenhouse gas emissions alone or ammonia alone, but combines these with water, biodiversity and soil health. Ad agreed. Yes. <laughs> I don't think I could I don't think I could say anything more than that. Yeah. I agree. You know, if we just if you just look at one metric, you're missing so much. And that's why it's important to, to look to look across the scale, multiple benefits. Okay, you have lots of comments here, and, and um, it's a credit to you uh, just commenting on how great the talk has been. So another one here saying, brilliant, thank you. It seems short-term goals are prioritised over long-term ecological goals. How to reconcile? Should restoration of biodiversity habitats prioritise the protection of what already exists? I guess. Um, yeah, absolutely. We need long-term thinking. And this is long-term approaches. And, you know, when we're talking about improving biodiversity and, and in biodiversity management, it's, 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 it's long-term. It's, it's, it's restoring what's lost as well as protecting what we have left. It's, it's, it's both of those things. What are your thoughts on exporting food production so we can increase biodiversity in Europe, but import food from, for example, Brazil? Oh, gosh. Um, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, we're, we're, we're all on one planet. Uh, everything we do influences each other. Um, you know, I'd, I'd, <coughs> ideally, we'd be 
um, eating more locally produced food. We diversify our food production here in Ireland. That would increase the, the, the diversity of the landscape, biodiversity. It would, it would reduce on carbon emissions for, for transporting food. Um, there's, you know, when, when we're importing food from, from elsewhere, we don't know what the damage is to those environments, um, particularly outside of Europe. Europe has very good environmental regulations compared to, to, to lots of other parts of the world. So um, it, it is a very difficult one to manage. Um, but, you know, I think, I think Europe is, is you know, the, the, um, the, the Green Deal, the biodiversity strategy, the farm to fork strategy, and the fact that, as, as Dara said last week, the fact that the farm to fork strategy and the biodiversity strategy were published on the same day and are talking to each other, that's massive, that's huge, and that's, that's, a, that's progress. Um, so I, I, hopefully we're going in the right direction, but it, yeah, it's, it's very complex. Okay, um, would tillage orchards and so on be better for preserving natural capital than cattle rearing or dairy? I think it's about diversity. So it's having diversity in the landscape. For me, if there's if there's tillage, if there's orchards, if there's um, grass for cattle, then you've got a variety of different um, land uses. You've got a variety of habitats. Uh, you've got diversity in the landscape. So it's not that any one production system is better than any other one. It's how they're managed, uh, how they're connected, uh, and how how they're they're interspersed in the landscape. I'm just going to keep throwing the questions at you because there's lots of them coming in and the clock is ticking. So how would you rate the modern organic farming methods as a benefit to biodiversity? It depends. So, I mean, organic farming um, in, involves not using um, uh, synthetic um, pesticides and agrochemicals and, and a lower stocking density on, on livestock farms. Um, and that, in theory, is good, um, but there are other um, chemicals that can be used that, that could be more damaging. So for example, you can use heavy metals uh, to control pests in, in um, apple orchards and things, um, which, which can be damaging just because they're not synthetic chemicals, they're, they're still damaging chemicals. So, so it, it, it's not that organic is the only answer. Um, I think certainly reducing chemical input and reducing um, intensity can be beneficial for for biodiversity and, and, and natural capital in general. A very open question for you, Jane. Can, can all of this be worked into reps too? Oh, wow. Uh, um, <laughs> I'd like to, I mean, I'd, I'd really like to see, to think that the, the, the next um, agri-environment scheme would, um, would take a lot more of this into account. So this idea of, of um, the, the, uh, the non-farmed areas is, is actually being productive, not necessarily in terms of producing food, but still producing benefits. I think I think we're nearly there. I hope so. I, I think that, that's my answer. I hope so. There's a, a question there. Uh, CAP seems to be the main mechanism uh, by which uh, monetary value would be placed on natural habitats on farms, but waiting for change to come through this avenue uh, it can be very slow. Uh, and even when it comes likely to be largely voluntary uh, uh, in terms of it becoming an issue for, for individual farmers. Getting to the question, should more funding be put in place to support attitudinal change in education? Uh, that, that's interesting. Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, I'd, uh, I'm in the business of education, so I guess I, I would always support more, more, more um, education. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, some of these policy changes do take a long time, but and an awful lot of farmers are, are doing are doing good things despite the policy, or, or you know, without waiting for the policy. And you know, you just look at some of the the guys nominated for the Farming for Nature um, are doing amazing things. So yeah, it's 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 it is about changing policy, but you're right, it's also about changing attitudes. Maybe one last question, Barry. Yep. Um, do you think Ireland is using less pesticides than the rest of Europe? Uh, no, that's an interesting question. It's actually really hard to say because the way that um, different countries report their pesticide usage, and it's something that we've been trying to do as part of the Protect project, is to look at pesticide use in comparison to other countries, uh, you know, accounting for area, accounting for crop type. Um, it's difficult. I, I, I think 
the answer is probably no. We're, we're probably, we can't pat ourselves on the back too much. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I think maybe, maybe wait until we finish the analysis and, and uh, we can come back with a proper answer for that. Okay. 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 Uh, listen, thank you very much, Jane. That was really invigorating or, and, and, and really challenging, I think, uh, uh, talk this morning. Uh, so thanks from all our, our listeners who have stayed intently listening to you right throughout. Uh, I also would like to say thanks to our production team, Andy Boland and Yvonne Maher and, and uh, Pori for, for assisting today. Uh, next week's, uh, on next week's seminar, on the second, we'll be uh, uh, discussing uh, with uh, Maria Long from the NPWS, uh, semi-natural grassland in Ireland, uh, a precious resource under, under threat. And following on from that, then we will have the, the following three weeks will be uh, from the Agricultural Catchments Programme. So with that, and uh, thanks to our, our contributors and, and thanks to you, the audience, for, for coming in once again. We we'll, we'll leave it there for today. Thank you. You've been listening to the podcast version of the Chagisk Signpost Series, the weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Don't forget to join us live every Friday morning for our latest webinar. For more, visit chagisk.ie. And you can also rate, review, and subscribe to the Signpost series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Mark Gibson, and thanks for listening.